fields of wheat ready for harvest. Not just any fields, but the battlefield where the Green Revolution began. In 65, uh, uh, we shipped 250 tons of seed to Pakistan and India. This was when the hunger and famine was getting out of complete control. And when those varieties received the type of uh, agronomy, restoring the soil fertility, control of weeds, insects if they were a problem, the production went from, in India, static for five years, at 11 and a half million tons to 75 million. And that's what was called the Green Revolution. You know, he had done this amazing work in Mexico, taking wheat and crossbreeding it, and, and really having a whole different approach to agriculture. So it was new seeds that he had developed that yielded more and were more disease resistant, and it was a, a whole different approach that he was conveying to farmers. If you do this, your yields can increase exponentially. His, his story is familiar. He went to India, went to Pakistan, they were facing famine, and his, his approach adopted in both countries, and they become self-sufficient and exporters. In just a few years, hundreds of millions of people are saved. Well, first, uh, Borlaug grew up in the Great Depression, and he grew up on a farm, and then he went to the University of Minnesota. And during the Minnesota years, there was a Great, there was a great Depression. In fact, he worked a couple of jobs. He was a wrestler. He also worked with, with was to become his wife in, in, a food, in food service. So the three prime motivators were one, that depression or poverty, two, that concern that, that things be done fast because people need to be fed now, not in the future. And three, that you can work with anybody and people, no matter what they're like, no matter what race, no matter what ethnicity, no matter what gender, will actually do it. Those are the three primary motivating factors behind the Green Revolution. The famine that they used to have in India and in Pakistan with new, these new varieties that were developed here, that's the reason of the Green Revolution. And the action of Dr. Borlo is not only on this valley, this valley and with our, with our farmers, but it's, through, it's throughout the world. At the same time, Norman Borlaug was working on ways to feed the world. Doomsayers led by Paul Ehrlich predicted mass famine and economic catastrophe. In his 1968 book, The Population Bomb, Ehrlich wrote, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. In the 1970s and 1980s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death, in spite of many crash programs embarked upon now. At this late date, nothing can prevent a substantial increase in the world death rate. I thank you very much for the support that you have all given, and especially in that critical period of the 60s when the world said nothing can be done. Look what happened. Thank you. I mean, obviously, we're very proud of him. And um, I think what's really neat about our family is that daddy's daddy. It doesn't, you know, he's not the father of the Green Revolution or the Nobel Peace Prize winner or the Medal of Freedom or the um, Congressional Gold Medal person. He is just my dad and two daddy to, to the grandkids and to the great grandkids. I am acutely conscious of the fact that I am but, but one member of that vast army of hunger fighters. And so I want to share not only the present honors, but also the future obligations with all my companions in arms for the Green Revolution has not yet been won. This is starvation yield, and that's what we've got too much of in the world. It's a big job to feed this current population of 6.6 .6 billion people. And uh, so if we want the possibility of world tranquility for our children, their children, and great-grandchildren, it won't be built, I say, on hunger and mi human misery. 
because those are very fertile grounds into all kinds of radicalisms, terrorisms, etc. People are often, you know, amazed at uh, how few days of actual food you have in storage. I mean, it, it's almost, uh, you know, we hear of, of industry talk about just in time. Well, you know, the sun shining on the wheat fields and rice fields of the world is also producing food just in time. If anything messes with that process, then you don't have food. I mean, we know that Asian countries have benefited greatly, you know, on this uh, green revolution. But even now that we are talking about biotechnology, you know, the green revolution has yet even to take real hold in Africa. What we have had the privilege of seeing, and in a small, modest way participating with in your extension service, on the basic food crops the last eight years, indicates that you can double, triple, and quadruple the yield. So the potential is there, but you can't eat potential. You've got to have reality, yes. grain, food to eat, to relieve human misery. Otherwise, we will have worse and worse chaos.